this is Krista Austin coming to you live from Emerging Black Studios and I'm here with our girl Mrs. Michelle Martin Pyramid. How you doing? Hey. Good. Hey girl. <laughs> um, so we're definitely here. Y'all we are making history right now. Michelle is the face and the, also the cover story and the interview story for our first magazine Emerging Black's first issue. So please be out on the lookout for that. Um, we're going to go ahead and do a quick interview about who she is and all that good stuff. Again, she is the face of this cover. We're going to discover so many things about her, about her story, about who she is now. So let's go ahead and get started. So hi, girl. Hi. Well, first of all, thank you for doing this, doing this interview. I'm honored. Thank I really you. Am, truly, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, a little bit about why we even decided to have you as the cover story, as the feature story for our first edition ever. Um, I remember me and you had a conversation sometime last month in the mixer and um, when I had first met you, which was I think two months ago, because mm -hmm. you came on for the podcast and you right, walked in the room. Is. Yeah, <laughs> as a guest. And that was our business episode. Mm -hmm. And you walked in and everybody had to introduce themselves. And we're like, okay, you know, I'm so and so, I'm a co host, I'm this, I'm that. <laughs> and then Michelle was like, yeah, um, so I'm an author, I'm a talk show host, I'm a radio host, I am the campaign manager. I, you know, I, I, used, I used to manage Lil Wayne, you know. <laughs> That's not a fact. <laughs> like all of these things, and it's like, oh my gosh, like who is this woman? Um, so just knowing you again with so many, there are so many parts of you um, that I kind of want to explore a little bit. So tell us, I mean, first and foremost, where did you even grow up? Um, I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, until I was about, I would say about eight, seven or eight. Then I moved to my, my mother and I relocated, and my brother and relocated to um, Hayward, California, Oakland, California. And then from there, we moved here to Jacksonville. So pretty much from 11th grade on up, I was in and out of Jacksonville. Okay. So what was that like for you as a kid? Um, it was, it was, <laughs> I, I, one of my favorite terms is colorful. I saw so many things. I endured so many things. And living with my great grandmother, which is who I was with when I was in Tulsa, um, she um, was the mother of the church. Her husband was Cornelius' grandfather. So you know, we're talking about wisdom and all this stuff, mm -hmm. and you know, and, you know, everything from sun up to sundown. We in that church house. So you know, I knew about the Lord very early. And um, then, then going transitioning into California, living with my mother, my mother. That's when I really started to realize the world. And I was just being acquainted with my brother because she left me, and she left me there in Tulsa. And she went to California, and I didn't even know I had a little brother until she came. And um, so, learning him and learning her, and um, that's when I started to really notice things, notice life, um, notice that my mom you know, had an illness, you know, she was a, a, a drug addict at the time. So then moving here, you know, then exploring other parts of, you know, my family and, you know, meeting and really getting to end up be around cousins and uncles and my grandmother and all that other stuff. So I'm like, okay, you know, there's a lot going on. So that was just those beginning years. Oh, wow. I can't even imagine. Uh, so talk to me. We are a Radio host, live show host, <laughs> campaign manager, author, what? <laughs> <laughs> we were still naming stuff. What? Right. <laughs> you can't box me in, man. Yeah. Um, I'm a certified life coach. I specialize in mental health wellness. I deal with the project process of like core issues. I deal with sexual trauma, substance, physical um, depression, anxiety, suicide, all the things that contribute to. Um, the life, your lifestyle, your, your your mental health, everything being shaken up. Um, I deal with the roots of those situations. Um, now an author, two times. Um, I also write. I um, also write. Um, I have a radio show. I am the first Jacksonville-based international TV show. Um, a mentor. Uh, now campaign manager. Um, and then. Coming on to the Emerging Black team, so this is a you know a new endeavor for me, um, using my creativity to be an executive producer 
um, with this being history, the first <laughs> black multimedia network company in the city. So I, I loved it. I love you. You did Thank so you. much. Oh my God. <laughs> so how did you even get here to this place that you are now? Again, you are a multifaceted woman. You do so much. But how does Michelle become all of these things? Do we have enough time for that? Girl, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> um, man, again, you have to understand where where my situ what the situation I was born into. So my mother's side is substance, sexual, and physical abuse. My father's side was incest and black magic. So I'm already born into like a little spiritual warfare type thing. Um, I know a lot of people don't really like to believe in that type of stuff, but forces are real. It's real. So, um, so I'm already born into a situation of confusion, a lot of secrets, a lot of deception, you know, um, so I'm experiencing these things. And then um, at six years old, I was sexually molested by my cousin. And then again, like I was saying before, you know, my mother was a drug addict, which I found, you know, as I got a, found out as I got a little bit older. And then, um, then moving here to Jacksonville, those things, you know, kind of followed and, you know, got worse. So um, being homeless and, um just it, it's just a variation of things um i went I, because i had a little brother and of course i didn't have all of the things that all the other kids had we didn't have all of that you know we went to the food bank and got a couple of bags of groceries every two weeks you know we didn't do all those things that everybody else did and so after so long i was like man some they got to give you know i got a little brother he, he need clothes i need school clothes we need food so um it was a young lady she was like a year year and a half older than me and at the time she was dating my god my god brother which he was an older man he was dating a younger woman and um a, a young a young lady and um she was a prostitute but my mother had a friend and she would dance so listening to the both of them I didn't go into prostituting, but I did go into dancing at 14. And I started out doing like private shows for like the police chief and the, you know, the, 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 the oh, jazz wow. and the fire chief. And the, you know, you'll be surprised who have key fetishes, you know. So that's, that's how I started. And then I actually went into the clubs when I got like 16. So um, I was in that lifestyle, you know. For why going to school in the daytime and then doing that and then um once i turned 16 i started dating a guy he was um he was 20 and um that's where the domestic stuff came in he um for a while it was you know okay you know it wasn't a big deal until he picked up a cocaine addiction and he at that time my mom you know he, she was putting me in and out you know let me come home put me out and, and i was staying you know with friends in and out this and that and so this particular time once she you know put me out of time i i was like stuck with him at that point he kept me captive in like a room and i had to just stay there and he would feed me daily snacks and he would you know go sell his drugs do whatever he did and then he'd come and he'd force me to um get high and he beat me and he raped me you know and it just it just escalated after one one day after i was left by myself i escaped i got a window and i just ran 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 until i got back um to my mother's home and um and it just it just was different things going on um transitioning in and out the home and i mean multiple suicide attempts and I mean, it got to the point where, you know, I became, you know, you know, physically, I became the, the physical abuser, but this was, you know, with later relationships. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, the, I started turning into that monster. So it just, after so long, after the last suicide attempt, um, I went to jail and I just sat there and I was just like, you know, I don't, I don't get it, Lord. I've never been happy. I don't understand why I'm here. It just doesn't make any sense, you know. Happy, what is that? And you know, he spoke to me, and I know it may sound cliche, but he spoke to me. He was like, everything that you went through has a mountain now. It's, it's time for you to start speaking. So that's when I started actually going into a transition with myself, like actually 
dealing with and understanding that I was in a depression. And when I got released and, you know, I just, I just was like, just kind of picking up the pieces and just like really dealing with stuff. And I had um, a lot of resentment towards my, um, my sexual abuser. I had a lot of resentment towards my father because he was absent. And I had a lot of resentment towards my mother um, because I felt like had I not, or had I gotten the proper protection and love and guidance and direction that I needed, I probably wouldn't have made some of the mistakes that I made, the, the decisions I made, wouldn't have trusted certain people. And so what I did was I just took the initiative to um, call my cousin and let him know, you know, the damage he did by uh, my, my surprise, which is not common usually at all. He, you know, he apologized and he was like, whatever I did, you know, I knew I didn't, I, I had no business doing that, but I had my own situations too, you know, and you know, however way that it affected your life, I apologize. I, you know, a uh, friend of mine flew, <laughs> flew my father in and I actually got to interact with him and for like about three days and we talked about some things we cried i mean we're still you know we're yeah. still some unresolved issues but we got to exchange that and um my mother i did make an attempt with with her but um everybody handles and deals with things differently you know um when you're dealing with you know self-restoration and forgiveness and things like that we have to understand that we're just, it's not going to always work out the way we want it to. We're not going to always get the apology that we think that we expect. Because the apology is like, uh, it's like somebody saying or confirming or taking ownership for what they did. So when somebody doesn't do it, we take it like, see, you just don't want to admit what you did. They are dealing with it. It's just they've never had to actually face that monster. Right. So walking that walk and, you know, do, learning things through trial and error. It, it, you know, it was it was rough. It was lonely. It was hard, you know, but I'm living proof that it definitely can be done. That's why um, finally she, which is an acronym for self-healing every day, it is a process. It is an everyday process, but it can be done. You just have to make that choice. You have to make a conscious decision that I'm going to put in work for me. You put in work for stale relationships. For rebellious kids and you know stuff like that, even fighting to go to the gym to maintain a certain body type, you fight for that. But why would you not fight for your sin? Why would you not fight for your peace? Why would you not fight to find identity, self worth, and value? So that's really what it's all about. That's how I got there. Oh wow. <laughs>
Michelle's bad. That's the bad child. You know what I'm saying? She's fast. She doing and even though I wasn't doing a lot of the things I was accused of, you know, it was just like nobody ever asked me how I feel. Nobody ever um takes the time to really appreciate my heart, even though I was like the go-to person for everybody and I was always the the shoulder to cry on, even living in the midst of what I was living in. Nobody ever said, thank you. I appreciate you. You're a good person. Keep it up. It was just like, oh, I, I, I got what I need from you, you know, and now I'm turning my back. So I just felt expendable at any given time. So it was like, what's the point? Wow. So you mentioned something earlier, too, um, and I think it's really common. A lot of black people in that community, all of our story isn't, hey, my mama or my dad was absent, but it's mm -hmm. very common. Mm -hmm. A lot of people grow up without fathers, um, unfortunately. How do we break that mold like what do you feel like needs to change mm -hmm. so that is no longer the black person's narrative like i grew up without my father i grew up without my mother how do we how do we change that well first and foremost we have to acknowledge and and go ahead and stop saying you don't understand it's always somebody that understands and we also have to really register that we've been taught the code of silence We've learned it very, very well. You know, it's like you keep your business in the house. But we also have to understand where that comes from. That comes from the yard, the plantation yard. You just do, we move in silence. We move in secrecy. We have to show and keep a stone face and show that we're maintaining and we're getting by. So as time has passed on and now that we have more rights and, you know, we have access to more financial gain and value. So now it's about perception financially. We don't know how to express emotion or vulnerability because we have a fear of it being used against us. Or we have actually made the attempt and we've been shut down because the person that we reach out to does not know how to respond to us. It becomes dismissive. So once we actually take accountability of what we don't understand, take the time to learn it and be a little bit more compassionate to other people and pay attention to more than just ourselves. I think that that can change a lot. I agree, 100%. Um, another question for you. Again, I do think you are, are, you know, you are this powerful black woman. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate that. Powerful black woman. Much similar to the last question. Um, as somebody who's in power, somebody who you're, um, I don't want to say the ratchet term plug, but we're going to go ahead and say the plug. Like a lot mm -hmm. of people know you and you're very well versed and known in the community. You know some of any and everybody. Mm -hmm. What do you feel like we need to do um, as a community to become, I guess, more one, more have more unity in the community? Um, I really feel like, well, I, I know it just has to be done. It's starting to um, slowly. Um, we need to understand that everybody has a different level of expertise. Everybody has a different le a level of education and understanding, and we need to un respect that. Um, my thing is, if you can sit in class all day and work hard for a diploma or uh, some type of degree being shoved information, and you don't know who wrote those books, you don't know how much of that information is true, but you take it in, you receive it as truth, and, you, and if somebody says a word incorrectly, misspells a word, says a, a president out of their spot, you're going to rebuttal them and correct them. So why is it that we can't receive information from each other? So we just need to like respect one another in their different le levels of expertise, build a strategy for whatever it is that needs help because we need help in a lot of areas because we've been the low man on the totem pole for a long time, but now it's prime time for us as a people. So we need to really understand everybody's level, respect that, build a strategy, execute effectively. That's, I, 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 that's what I really believe and I know. I absolutely agree. We could spend this whole <laughs> <laughs> this whole interview talking about that because I agree when it comes to the community. Um, we have a, there's a distrust mm -hmm. there with each other. There's a distrust. There's this thing where it's like, like you said earlier, what happens in the house stays in this house. So mm -hmm. whatever me and my family or me and my community go through, we kind of keep it in mm -hmm. and hold tight to it. Um, and again, it comes with figuring out solutions to that and figuring out the root of the issue about mm -hmm. where that comes from. So I do want to switch gears a little bit more mm -hmm. um, and talk about 
you, of course. <laughs> so my question for you is, again, you are a wife, a mother, a career woman. How do you find that balance with everything? It was hard at first because it was a it was a transition. Like, even with going through all of those things and experiences, like, I actually learned a lot. A lot of people took me under their wing. Like, you know, entertainment industry, you know, um, music, um, movies, uh, I, you know, um, athletics. You know, I just saw so much. I learned so much, and it was like, it was a form of protection, but it wasn't from the right people. I guess I'll say the other expected people. So the people that brought me in and were showing me things and teaching me stuff, it was like, wow, you know, at that time, I didn't know what I needed it for, you know. So it was it was a transition because I was a teen, teenage mother first, and then I became a wife, and then I had my other two children. So it went from making a, a, a pledge to myself to not whenever I had because I lost a couple of kids so I made a pledge to myself that whenever I actually have a child I will make sure that that child does not experience or feel what I you know felt so I was like gung-ho when I had my son and even though I was dancing I had a day job I was dancing at night and then I was doing here on the weekend so I had like my own place, all of that, fully front leather front. I, I was living. You hear me? <laughs> yeah, I had my leather and all of that. So I mean, you know, I, I lived really good. And then, um, then like I said I was in a serious relationship. And then I started having. I had my second daughter, and then I got married. And then I mean, I had my first daughter, and then I got married, and I had my second daughter. So you know, learning how to be a wife and. Um, be a mother that was you know the challenge and stuff and i mean that's still you still still a learning process because you constantly grow people change all the time so you have to constantly relearn your spouse who you with and um keep lines of communication open and then as my journey and my career started to like blossom and bloom it kind of started taking a toll at home you know because they were accustomed to me being at all the time you know preparing the meals and cleaning the house and this and this and this so you know teaching independence and um all of that and also me emotionally having to dis you know detach a little bit too because i'm not i can't physically be there at all times but i, I make it a point to keep all lines of communication open telling my kids what i'm doing bring them with me let them see and um understand that i mean they know my story front to back you know even though their age is vary and range I need them to understand the purpose what I'm doing it for you know it's one thing to say I'm doing this so you can have what I didn't have but I want you to see and feel and connect and see other people in these situations as well so that you don't take what you receive and the lifestyle that's being developed for granted and understand what generational wealth and you know longevity and legacy means so that's that's how I found balance, just keeping lines of communication open. So it's not, you don't have like a, a formula or anything? <laughs> just, no, but no, just, you know, just, just making sure that they're on the journey with me. You know, and just like my husband and my kids, you, I need you to see what I'm doing. I need you to understand this is why I can't. But understand it's not in vain. I'm doing this for us. So that would be my, my formula instead of being so secretive and saying what the, the child can't handle. You don't know what the child can handle unless they're exposed to it. I, I love your answer because, um, again, when it comes to the whole formula thing, um, some people just think, you know, it's simple and then you have those who are like, there isn't you know, mm -hmm. a balance. You kind of just get things done. But your whole purpose of what you're doing is that you're being open and transparent with your children and you're mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm, I might can't do this or be here, but you're doing it, mm -hmm. like you said, to create generational wealth, mm -hmm. which is something the black community needs, because we don't know a lot about mm -hmm. generational wealth. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of our time um, working for other people and having um, spending so much time for mm -hmm. other organizations instead of us really creating our own, so the right. fact that you're so intertwined. Um, with that entrepreneurial side of yourself. Mm -hmm. I love it. That's exactly why we have you here. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're just so well versed in everything.
what would you do differently? I would do nothing. Because I wouldn't be able to be the voice of so many people in need. That's why that's like my motto. No excuses. You can't tell me you can't. Cause, and you can't tell me I, nobody understands. Because yes, I do. I, I always say I think I've lived several life, lifetimes before 30. <laughs> you told me that you're like I love like three <laughs> lifetimes of three people because again your story is just so fascinating um, and it's one very powerful um, and the fact that you come through it mm -hmm. that's the miracle because like you said earlier so many people have gone through just a portion of what you're going through but they didn't make it mm -hmm. they succeeded uh, probably trying you know um, with the whole suicide thing or they succeeded mm -hmm. with getting overwhelmed by drugs and abuse and all that kind of thing Thing, but mm -hmm. clearly God had a purpose for you mm -hmm. to be here in this moment. Um, my last question for you is what advice would you give to somebody who is either where you are now or where you were? You can't stop. Because if you if you are where I was, you're too deep. And if you where I am now, you're too deep. You can't go back. You, there's nowhere to go but up. So just keep the fight going, fight for you, put you first. And again, generational wealth is not just economic, it's values. Who sets the tone? Who, who chooses to be the voice? Who breaks the cycle? That's the powerful one. Um, that's a good quote. Um, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you so much for, again, being our, the first, on the first cover of Emerging Black's first magazine. Super, super amazing. You are a part of us making history mm -hmm. so thank you everybody who watched this video again our first issue of emerging black magazine will be coming out on november 15th you'll be able to download the pdf it will be a digital magazine um again we are here with mrs michelle martin pyramid y'all she is everything you can name she is <laughs> she is that so again this is krista austin live to you from emerging black studios have a good night